Hello and welcome to how to apply the law on murder. This video will help you do just that. Now this is focused for A-level law students, particularly for my students. And this video will help you focus on the structure of the application. It will have an application focus. So I have done the previous video and there's a lot of good videos out there which explain the law on murder. Now don't forget it should be that those building blocks. This is purely focusing on application and a guide to do that. And we will talk through a worked example on how to do it. Quite a simple example, but just to demonstrate how we use those questions. So a word on the structure. This is a structure I use. You may use a different structure. I've seen things like ISAS, but I use IDAC. And for the purposes of this, if you use this to help you, fantastic. Or you can adapt to suit. The structure is, is malleable. You can change it if necessary. Now, the first thing you need to do is to identify the problem. So in this case, we're identifying part of the problem or the problem as murder. Once we've established that murder is the case, we need to define murder. Now, this helps you structure your response. It also acts as a checklist. Once you're given a definition for murder, essentially, as you go through all of the elements of murder and you separate them into the actus reus and mens rea elements, then this will help you formulate that well written response. We always need to explain the law. Now, from an AQA perspective, the assessment objective one is to explain the law, whereas assessment objective two is to apply the law. Assessment objective three is to analyze the law. Now, this is done while applying and the better students or the harder working students will keep doing that as they go. Once we've applied the law to the scenario, we conclude. Now just a little bit about the explain and apply. Some students like to explain each element and apply each element as they go. Some students like to explain all the actus reus, apply all the actus reus, then explain causation or explain mens rea and apply those two. It's entirely up to you which method you choose so long as you explain the law with case law, you apply it well, you analyse the law as you apply and you conclude. So to start at the beginning, we define murder. So again, this will give you a frame in which to work. So the unlawful killing of another human being under the Queen's peace with malice of forethought. We get that definition or the adaption of the de definition from Lord Taylor. That will frame your response. It will act as a checklist. So not forgetting, we need first to explain all of these elements. Now we can do that, as I say, in a different way. You can explain what unlawful means and apply what unlawful means to the scenario. You can explain what a killing is and apply that to the scenario. Human being, you can explain and then apply Queen's Peace. You can explain and apply. It's entirely up to you. So long as all those elements are covered, you use cases and you apply it well, you analyse the law as you go, you will be fine. So how do we apply unlawful? Well, all we're really asking is, is there a legal justification for the killing in the scenario? And if not, it's unlawful. So make sure you give some examples. So you give some examples that will help you analyze the law as you go, such as legitimate medical treatment. This could be a legal justification for the killing. Self-defense, that could be a legal justification for the killing. If you're killed in the line of duty, for example, a police officer, or if you're in the armed forces and it's within the remit of your, uh, your target or your job. So is there a legal justification for the killing? If not, it is unlawful. We move on. So killing is arguably then the one, the element you need to analyze most. This one you need to explain carefully, apply carefully. And to do that, we need to consider two ways. Now, if you follow my video, you've watched my video on the explanation of murder, you'll know I chose this format. In essence, within killing, we need to consider in which way was the death brought about and then consider causation. So with direct killing, we ask, was there something which was done by the defendant to bring about the death? So we looked at the case of Adams, for example, and that was a needle, uh, an injection which caused death. 
So it could be anything. It could be a stabbing. It could be a shooting. It could be beating over the head with a chair. Was there an act which caused the death? If not, consider the next thing. Was there an indirect killing? Now we looked at this when we looked at the case of Mackey, so where the victim tried to escape. But you've got cases like Roberts where the victim tried to escape, Corbett where the victim tried to escape, and so on. All these things in which it's indirect, they force something to happen, and that causes the death. So there's no blood on their hands, so to speak, but they did something which was an indirect cause of death. And of course, where a duty exists, a killing may be done through an omission. So again, you can look at any number of ways in which the duty can arise. And if the defendant has failed in their duty, then they may have caused death. So in every one of those statements, only needs to be one. But in every one of those statements, I've mentioned the word causation, which is why I lump these together, because they're inextricably linked. The death needs to be brought about and it needs to be caused. Now, in a slight difference, we need the first two to be satisfied in order for a causation to be satisfied. So in this case, then, factual causation, the but-for test. But for the actions of the defendant, would the victim have died? In terms of legal causation, ask yourself in that scenario, is there more than a minimal cause? Kimsey tells us that there needs to be a more than slight or trifling link. So you need to really do a deep analysis on the scenario if there's something which has happened in between what the defendant has done and the eventual death. Consider, has it, has it broken the chain? And it takes us a new intervening act in a moment, but ultimately, are they still responsible legally? And there's a bit of a moral question, but we've got authorities to base our judgments on. Next, new and intervening act. So if something did happen in between the defendant's actions and the death, we need to consider, is that the cause of death? Does that remove liability from the original defendant? Now, again, we have rules surrounding medical treatment. We have rules surrounding the thin skull rule. We have rules surrounding the victim trying to escape. Now, in terms of the victim trying to escape, if that happened in your scenario and it is reasonable, then it will not break in the chain. We use Corbett as an example. If, for any reason, medical treatment has occurred and it's bad medical treatment, remember, it needs to be really, really bad for it to be the cause of death and therefore remove liability from the original defendant. So, Jordan, the injury had already healed. In Cheshire and in Smith, the cases were quite bad in the medical treatment were quite bad in those cases however the original defendant was still responsible now it may mention in your scenario something like antibiotics they were given antibiotics or the ambulance crashed now you need to make a judgment and the ability to analyze the ability to weigh up both arguments and fall in one or fall down on one side will help you with respect to your answer and also gaining those higher marks. So be sure you analyse both sides before concluding as to what you feel. So we've dealt with killing now. Human being is the next element. And this is not a major issue in exam questions. So with respect to human being, the person is mostly going to be a human being or always going to be a human being. It's very, very unlikely that for a 16, sorry, 18 year old, sorry, to have a question or the nominal 17, 18 year old to get a question in which a baby has been killed. It's too emotive. It's not going to happen. We need to consider then, has the victim been fully expelled from the mother's womb before the attack? That is the test for a human being. So once we've dismissed the idea of a human being, and they always, always will be, then we consider the Queen's peace. And much in the same way, it's not a major issue in exam questions. So is the killing during wartime? If not, the killing will be during the Queen's peace. Mostly, it's going to be, isn't it? So we need then to consider once we've established, we do a mini conclusion. So the actus reus of murder does exist or doesn't exist. If it doesn't exist, don't go any further. If it does exist, the mens rea needs to be proven. Now, in terms of malice of forethought, then, we know what that means. It's either intent to kill 
or intend to cause really serious harm. Now, I mentioned in my explanation video that we need to choose one from each of these. So in essence, one from each of these roles. It's either intent to kill or intent to cause serious harm in the scenario. And then it's either a direct intent to kill or an oblique intent to kill or direct intent to cause serious harm or direct oblique intent to cause really serious harm. So we need to make sure we do one from each and then see where we go. Now intent to kill, look at the scenario. Is there language in that scenario? Or is it obvious in the scenario that the person intended to kill? So it could be he decided to kill or he pointed the gun at this person and shot. Those are pretty easy to identify the intent to kill. But in truth, not many people are convicted of intent to, of murder with the intent to kill. So we need to be a bit more analytical. In terms of implied malice, this is the intent to cause really serious harm. So this is if someone picks somebody over the head but it repeatedly hits them or they lose the temper and they keep hitting this person. That's probably going to be serious harm. That's enough. That's all we need for murder. So don't get too bogged down in it. In either his intent to kill or intent to cause serious harm. And don't forget to use our cases to support. Once we establish that, we need to use either direct intent or oblique intent. Now, if it's if it's direct intent, then we need to obviously look at whether it's the main aim, objective, and desire, and of course, the language will be obvious there. If not, it's likely to be oblique intent, and again, we apply the Nedrick test in this situation. Was it virtually certain that the defendant's actions were going to cause death, if there's expressed malice, or serious harm, if there's implied malice? And secondly, does the defendant realise this? So we have an objective and a subjective element. Be sure to go through those. And again, you can pause this to help. If you wish, you can use this chart instead. But ultimately, we've got the men's rate for murder. We've got express malice. And you've got direct or oblique. And then you've got implied malice. And again, you've got direct or oblique intent. Once you've solidified your mind, make sure you write out a sentence. There is a direct intent to kill, oblique intent to kill, or whatever, and apply it well. Now, don't forget, your mind needs to look at other matters, such as coincidence of actus reus and mens rea, or more likely, transferred malice. So now we're going to focus on the worked example. Now, this is a very simple scenario. Uh, for the reasons, just to keep it simple, to show how this might work. Now, if you have an example with you, you can rewind this video to the beginning and let me talk you through and just do the questions as I ask. So, the scenario we have is Regina intends to kill David. Now, she fixes an explosive booby trap to the front door of his house so that when he opens it, the explosive will go off. Unbeknown to Regina, David sent giving the keys to Bertrand and told him to collect some papers from there. Now Bertrand opens the door and is killed by the explosion. So a reminder of the structure for this then, we need to identify the problem. This is a simple scenario. We need to identify the problem as one of murder. We then define a the murder to give a structure, explain each element, apply each element, and then conclude whether we think murder is here or not. And don't forget also, if we found her guilty, we give a sentence. So a reminder of the definition of murder, this is the unlawful killing of another human being under the Queen's peace with malice of forethought, and this will frame your response really well. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to have a repeat of the explanation phase, but you'll see the slides changing to incorporate the answers. So we start with unlawful. We've said already there's no legal justification for the killing, and we give examples of when it might be lawful to kill. But in this particular case, there isn't any legal justification for the killing. There is no justification for putting a booby trap on the door of David's house. The killing is arguably the most complex matter we look at. So we'll deal with that now. And again, we need to look at the way in which the death was brought about. Now, if you go back, you'll remember that direct killing, indirect killing, or killing when there's a mission where duty exists, it only needs to be one of them. So let's consider the first one. We'll start at the most serious and work our way down. So direct killing, in this particular case, there was a direct killing as the booby trap caused the death. 
So it's almost, if you had this as an indirect killing, there might well be an argument that it is. There's a trap, it goes off. But it certainly is a direct act and it caused death. Nothing happened in the interim. So, for example, someone trying to escape. But uh, it is a direct killing. So, again, we'd use a case. So, it's not an indirect killing then because it's not a situation which has left somebody to die. They've made something happen to kill somebody. And again, there's no duty of care here. So, we don't need this either. So, to sum, we've got a direct killing as the booby trap caused the death. Nice and easy, we'll get a direct killing. In terms of causation then, we need both factual and legal causation. In terms of factual causation, we ask the before test. Well, in this case, before the booby trap being placed and exploding, Bertrand would not have died. So that makes Regina the factual cause of death. Now let's consider whether the, she is the legal causation, legal cause. And so we have the booby trap was more than the trifling link. Indeed, in this case, it's really simple. It was the main cause of death. Was there an intervening act? No, this is a fairly simple scenario. There was no break in the chain as nothing occurred between the booby trap being placed and the death to remove liability. Now, this might be the case in the scenario you're looking at, and that's absolutely fine. Make sure you do ask those questions. Did something happen in the meantime? If it did, discuss whether it falls into the established categories, such as medical treatment and the victim trying to escape, and then also apply the thin skull rule if necessary. We consider human being, but as I said, it's not a major, major issue in exam questions. Obviously, without doubt, Bertrand is a human being. He's been expelled from his mother's womb. Presumably, he's old enough to be employed and therefore is a human being. So no questions there in terms of it being in doubt. And once we've done that, the Queen's Peace, we need to establish, was the killing during wartime? If not, it's during Queen's Peace. Well, the killing here has taken place in a situation outside of war and is therefore during the Queen's Peace. So now we look at men's way of murder. Once we've established in this case, there is actus reus of murder. Make sure that we say that. A little sentence to say there is an actus reus and then move on to explain and apply the men's way. So the men's way of murder then is the express malice or implied malice and either direct or oblique intent. So again, we take select each of those which we consider to be the most appropriate. So going back to the scenario, Regina decided to place a booby trap to harm David or to kill David. That's the question. So express malice intent to kill. I would argue that by placing the booby trap, it's obviously intended to kill. Now it would require knowledge of how the booby trap would work. So she's intended to kill David. And in this particular situation, the booby trap is sort of like a bomb. So if it's killed and it's it is um, dangerous enough to kill, then she's intended to kill. Implied malice though. At the very least, if you are unsure about whether it's direct intent, sorry, intent to kill, then it would most certainly be intent to cause really serious harm. So you can analyse that situation. If you felt in that situation it was intent to cause serious harm because it was there was too little information about intent to kill, then go with that. Okay, you will get credit for doing that. And again, is the direct intent to kill or oblique intent to kill? Now in this particular situation, it tells you the language in the scenario tells us that she decided to kill him. And so that swings it into the direct intent category. And so it seems that to kill was the main aim, objective or desire. So oblique intent is not necessary. But again, if you felt in the scenario that there's oblique intent, say that there's not, not enough evidence to suggest the main aim, objective or desire is to kill or cause serious harm and give oblique intent instead and go through the Nedrick test. Now you can rewind and go back on the Nedrick test if you need to in the how to portion of this video rather than the application video to a particular scenario. So again, if you prefer to work visually, you may wish to do this instead to so go and use the men's rape murder chart. And again, other matters may need to be addressed. So the first one is the coincidence of actus reus and mens rea. But again, 
it's unlikely to come up in this scenario, but it's something to be aware of. But certainly here we know that there's transfer malice, so we know there's an intent to kill, a direct intent to kill, in fact, but it's a different victim. So we do need to make sure we mention this. So the malice intent transfers from the intended victim, which is David, to the actual victim, which is Bertrand. And so again, we make sure using case law all the way through that we apply each particular element. Now a little note before we finish then about this is that the assessment objective one is your explanation. That does need to be good to give you a good structure. Assessment objective two is that deciding on the application and it's very simple it's very straightforward in terms of picking out the assessment objective three is sort of linked to both and that's the ability to raise up those possibilities and then tell us where you fall do you believe it's this or that and always justifying and always using case law and authorities in terms of act when appropriate to establish your viewpoint but I hope this has helped. If you want any further guidance then, so I've got written versions of this guide which is slightly more detailed. And if you are interested in that, if you're one of my students, come and see me, I'll give it to you. However, if you are interested and you're not one of my students, I'm quite happy to send it over. You can email me at reasonabledanlaw at gmail.com. Thanks for watching.